that in searching for the causes of the great upheavals of the past and in considering their effects, I became skeptical of the great theories concerning celestial motions that were formulated when the historical facts described here were not all known to science. The subject deserves to be discussed in detail and quantitatively. All that I would venture to say at this time and in this place is the following. The accepted celestial mechanics notwithstanding the many calculations that have been carried out to many decimal places or verified by celestial motions stands only if the sun, the source of light and warmth and other radiation produced by fusion and fission of atoms, is as a whole an electrical neutral body and also if the planets in their usual orbits are neutral bodies. Fundamental principles in celestial mechanics, including the law of gravitation, must come into question if the sun possesses a charge sufficient to influence the planets in their gravitation, in their orbits or comets in theirs. In the Newtonian celestial mechanics, based on the theory of gravitation, electricity and magnetism play no role. Emanuel Velikovsky, New York, 1950. Preface 1965 First published in 1950, this book was left unchanged in all subsequent printing, nor have any textual changes been made in this paper-bound edition. This was so by design. I wish to keep the text in its original form in order that, unaltered, it should face all subsequent discovery in the fields it covers or touches upon. Should there have been changes, the reader of a new edition would be unable to judge to what extent a book heretical in 1950 could measure up to later developments. In 1950, it was generally assumed that the fundamentals of science were all known and that only details and decimals were left to fill in. In that same year, a cosmologist, certainly not of a conservative bent of mind, Fred Hoyle, wrote in the conclusion of his book, The Nature of the Universe. It is likely that any astonishing new developments are lying in wait for us. It is possible that the cosmology of 500 years hence will extend as far beyond our present beliefs as our cosmology goes beyond that of Newton. And he continued, I doubt whether this will be so. I am prepared to believe that there will be many advances in the detailed understanding of matters that still baffle us. But by and large, I think that our present picture will turn out to bear an approximate resemblance to the cosmologies of the future. And he referred to the limitations of optical means in penetrating the depth of space. The years that have passed since the publication of Worlds in Collision have seen the first great achievements in radio astronomy, the discoveries of the International Geophysical Year, and the dawn of the Space Age. The picture has changed completely. Signs of recent violence, disruption, Fragmentation have been observed on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system. A submarine, gigantic canyon that runs almost twice around the globe, a sign of global twist, a layer of ash of extraterrestrial origin underlying all oceans. Paleomagnetic evidence that the magnetic poles were suddenly repeatedly reversed and it is claimed the terrestrial axis with them. Gas is escaping on some craters on the moon thought to be cold to its center and exceedingly high surface heat on Venus. Furthermore, with the discovery of radio signals arriving from Jupiter of the existence of a magnetosphere surrounding the Earth of the solar plasma of the net charge on the Sun and the magnetic field permeating the interdisciplinary field of space, decisive evidence has come up that the solar system and the universe in general are not electromagnetically sterile. A basic change in, in the understanding of the universe, its nature, and the forces active in it. The words found in the preface of the 1950 edition, designating the work as heresy, in realms where the names Newton and Darwin reign supreme, should no longer invoke a spontaneous rejection on the part of even the most conservative in science unless it is a defense mechanism devised to protect an inner realization of incertitude. What to the scientist constitutes a really satisfactory sort of success
for a theory. The answer lies largely in the words generally elegance, control, and prediction. As to generality, hardly anyone raised an objection. Possibly there was some elegance in the timing when these words were written in 1960, ten years after the publication of my book and the great opposition it provoked. Some of the mostly compelling data were radioed by the space vehicle Pioneer 5. I would like to relate here a few details about the control and prediction of two crucial tests. Decisive for this book, early in my work, I came to the understanding that Venus is a newcomer to the planetary family, that it had a stormy, if only short, history, and that it must still be very hot and giving off heat. Further, that it must be surrounded by a very extensive envelope of hydrocarbon, petroleum, gases, and dust. Such claims were in total disagreement with what was known in 1946 when I completed the manuscript of the work, or in 1950 when it was published, to stress the crucial nature of these claims. They were put under the headings, the gases of Venus and the thermal balance of Venus, immediately preceding the section, the end. Should I be right in these claims, the entire chain of deductions of which identification of the extraterrestrial agent of the paroxysm described is but the final ring, is strengthened. And, since these crucial claims were in flagrant discord with the accepted values, in case of confirmation they ought not to be denoted as lucky guesses. As late as 1959, Venus, ground temperature, was calculated to be only 17 degrees Celsius three degrees above the mean annual temperature of the Earth. But by 1961, from the nature of the radio signals emitted by Venus, it was found that Venus ground temperature is about 315 degrees Celsius, or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Dr. F. D. Drake of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, responsible for this reading, wrote, we would have expected a temperature only slightly greater than that of the Earth, and the find was a surprise in a field in which the fewest surprises were expected. There was, admittingly, no satisfactory explanation of such high temperature of Venus in the frame of the accepted notions. Greenhouse effect could not explain so high a temperature, nor could radioactivity decaying for billions of years. The Mariner 2 a space vehicle that passed Venus in December 1962 was instrumented to detect whether the heat is real and as high as 600 degrees. It found it real and a full 800 degrees and found also that the night side of Venus, if anything, hotter than the day side and that light does not penetrate the cloud cover. It must be gloomy and bleak under this cover. It is stated in the Mariner project by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Very little greenhouse effect could realize itself under such conditions. The other crucial test concerned the gaseous envelope of the planet. In 1946, four years before publication of this book, I directed a request and inquiry to Professor R. Wilt of Yale and the late Professor W. S. Adams of Mount Wilson and Palomar Observatories. Foremost authorities on the subject of planetary atmosphere. You know, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if Halton R. knew about Velikovsky and what his thoughts were on him. That would be interesting, because Halton R. was at Palomar, right? Furthermost authorities on the subject of planetary atmosphere indicating that the presence of hydrocarbon gases and dust in the cloud envelope of Venus would constitute a crucial test for the cosmological concepts evolved from the study of historical sources. Wilt wrote on September 13, 1946, the absorption spectrum of Venus atmosphere cannot be interpreted as resulting from gaseous hydrocarbons. Adams answered September 9, 1946, there is no evidence of the presence of hydrocarbon gas in the atmosphere of Venus. I must have been completely firm in my belief of not having made a wrong deduction. From the first premise of global catastrophe to the last one, 
of identifying the agent to have chosen to print in disregard of the expert opinions on the basis of this research. I assume that Venus must be rich in petroleum gases. On February 26, 1963, Making known the results of the Mariner probe, Dr. Homer Newell of NASA announced that in the judgment of those responsible for that part of the program, Venus is enshrouded in an envelope of hydrocarbon gases and dust, 15 miles thick, 45 miles above the ground of the planet. It was acknowledged as very puzzling that Venus should have such a massive atmosphere, a score of times heavier than the terrestrial atmosphere, that it should have taken the form of an envelope 45 miles above the surface of the planet, and that it should consist of heavy molecules of hydrocarbon gases and dust. It was also found that Venus rotates retrogradely, though very slowly, a sign of its having been disturbed in its motion in the past, or having been captured by the sun, or having originated in a way different from the other planets. At the time of the Mariner probe, two prominent members of the American scientific community, V. Bargman, professor of physics, Princeton University, and Lloyd Motz, professor of astronomy, Columbia University, wrote a letter to science, December 21st, 1962, claiming for me the correct prediction of the great heat of Venus, of the radio noises from Jupiter, of the existence of a magnetosphere around the Earth. A paper, some additional examples of correct prognosis, written by me, was printed in the September 1963 issue of the American Behavioral Scientist. It contains a survey of various tests, confirmations, and supporting evidence. And that issue, sponsored by a group of eminent men in scholarship and public affairs, has also told the story of reception or rejection of this book, coupled with efforts toward its suppression. It was actually successfully suppressed while in the hands of the first publisher, who had to give it up, though a number one bestseller, under the exerted boycott of all this publisher's textbooks by certain groups organized for that purpose in some of the academic councils of the country. Some attempts were made to minimize the value of the crucial test claim and confirmations obtained. A prominent astronomer wrote in December 1963 issue of Harper's, as to the high temperature of Venus, hot is only a relative term. For example, liquid air is hot relative to liquid helium, whereas I claimed an incandescent state of Venus and a gaseous state of all hydrocarbons. Professor H. H. Hess, chairman of the Space Board of the National Academy of Sciences, volunteered to write me a letter for publication. Some of these predictions were said to be impossible when you made them. All of them were predicted long before proof that they were correct came to hand. Conversely, I do not know of any specific prediction you made that was since proven to be false. If my premises are wrong, and only by sheer chance did I obtain such a score, then the theorists of probabilities ought to find out the odds involved. If, as some friendlier skeptics assume, the score is due to an unusual gift of intuition, then I should be accused of sorcery not only of heresy. However, if the story is a reconstruction of the events that took place and of logical implications of them, then the score is but a natural fallout from a single central idea, our Jurgens. Nevertheless, more efforts were made to disqualify this work, but hardly any astronomical argument of 1950 could be brought profitably against my book in 1964 without denying all the important discoveries of the intervening years. Therefore, attempts were made to evade all these issues and to switch the debate, actually a campaign of depreciation, to questioning my proper use of sources. When a journal printed for physicists serves its readers with philological arguments in Egyptology and commits the task to a journalist uninformed and rash in the mild appraisal of Professor Moses Masias and prints a vulgar display of ignorance and distortion, then it is as good as an admission that none of the physical arguments employed earlier could carry weight, and no new ones could be devised. It is about 
Such tactics that the student paper, the Daily Princetonian, wrote editorially February 1964, while it could have been assumed that anyone challenging the basic premises of Newton and Darwin might be laying himself open to a certain amount of argument, the personal vituperation, deliberate misrepresentation of facts, offhand misquotations, efforts at suppression of the books containing the theories and the denial of the right to rebut opponents in professional journals that Dr. Velikovsky encountered indicate that far more was going on than mere challenge to established ideas. What the Velikovsky affair made crystal clear is that the theories of science may be held not only for the truth they embody, but because of the vested interests they represent for those who hold them. The deplorable tactics of certain groups in the academia are not alienated the younger generation and the historical and physical evidence accumulating with each passing year did not escape their sight and conclusions were drawn. What was unbelievable and heretical in 1950 is making great inroads into the science that claimed dogmatic completeness and infallibility as recently as then. On the eve of the publication of Worlds in Collision, the Professor H. Butterfield wrote The Origin of Modern Science, 1949. But the supreme paradox of the scientific revolution is in the fact that things which we find it easy to instill into the boys at school, things which would strike us as the ordinary natural way of looking at the universe, defeated the greatest intellects for centuries. The author, 1965. Indeed. Thank mm -hmm. you.